Hello everyone, hope all of you are safe and healthy. Welcome to IS Baba's Rapid Revision Series for Prelims 2021. This is Session 40 and Day 54. And the topics we have are Science and Tech Health Issues. So these are the hot topics we are going to discuss. That is the Persistent Organic Pollutants and DDT and Endosulfan and the ill effects then Diclofenac and Neonicotinoids. Then Coronavirus Mutation, then Thrombosis, then Perosmia and Mycormycosis that is in the wake of COVID-19 once again. Then Neuroprosthesis, Neural Disorders like Parkinson's Disease, Huntington Disease etc. we discuss here. Then Omega-3 Fatty Acids and Trans Fats and Monoclonal Antibodies. So coming to the first one, the Persistent Organic Pollutants. Friends, why was it in use? Because the COP10 or the 10th Conference of Parties meeting to Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants was held in July 2021. So a recent one and then in the last year in July 2020, the new restrictions on perfluorooctanoic acids came into effect. So this is the new entrant to the list of persistent organic pollutants and we will remember it. Now coming to more about Stockholm Convention. So Stockholm Convention provides three annexes that is Annex A, Annex B and Annex C. So Annex A contains those list of chemicals which has to be completely eliminated by the member countries. Then Annex B contains those chemicals which has to be restricted. So need not be eliminated completely but only restriction is a stipulation. Then Annex C, here the chemical has to be reduced. Then more about Stockholm Convention, the Global Environmental Facility is the designated interim financial mechanism. That is the Global Environmental Facility, it provides the financial support to the Stockholm Convention and then United Nations Industrial Development Organization that is UNIDO, it takes the responsibility of developing nations to help them implement the measure. So UNIDO helps the third world to implement Stockholm Convention. Then coming to more about persistent organic pollutants. So these are the lists of persistent organic pollutants that is the pesticides like aldrin, chlordane, DDT, dieldrin, endrin, heptachlor, heptachlorobenzene, then myrex and toxaphene. Then the industrial chemicals like hexachlorobenzene, then polychlorinated biphenyls and then polychlorinated dibenzo P dioxins and polychlorinated dibenzo furons. Friends, UPSC will ask individually on these chemicals that is DDT was asked, heptachlor was asked and biphenyls and bisphenyls was asked in one year. So likewise, so whenever we get the time, we have to individually do some research over these chemical lists. And these are the harmful effects that these chemicals produce. That is, they are distributing throughout the soil, water and air. So they are all pervading. So they will be persistent throughout the year or for several years together in soil, water and air. And they can get accumulated in the fatty tissues of living organisms, including humans. So they have the ability to bioaccumulate. And then these are the ill effects that is cancer, allergies, hypersensitivity, then damage to central and peripheral nervous system, then reproductive disorders and disruption to immune system and endocrine disruptors. So endocrine disruption in the sense those hormones, maybe the sex hormones, pituitary hormones, growth hormones, all those will be affected. Then come to next DDT and endosulfan. Friends, DDT it is a highly persistent chemical and it is called organophosphate. So what is the chemical name of DDT? It is dimethyl diethyl tetrachloroethane. So it is an organophosphate that is a carbon compound with phosphate and it is readily absorbed by soil and is hydrophobic. So it is absorbed by soil but it is not dissolving in water. So it is hydrophobic not philic. Then it was used extensively during World War II against malaria and to control the insect vectors of typhus. So for the diseases like typhus, scrub typhus etc. DDT was used. Then in 1962 Raquel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring that is detailing the dangers of this DDT. So it was a book that is why birds are being reducing that is due to DDT consumption the birds were reducing and Raquel Carlson he wrote the story of those birds. Then in 1972 the use of this pesticide was banned in the US and now it is banned by several nations because it is a POP persistent organic pollutant. Then it enters food chains and results in bioaccumulation. Yes friends it is having the capability of bioaccumulation and biomagnification. Then it can cause weakening of eggshells and it can result in reproductive failures among birds and fishes. 
So, the weakening of egg shells is one of the main cause for extinction of several bird population in the world friends. That is, these eggs, they become weak and before being hatched, they will break down. And it will cause reproductive failures in worms, testes, testosterone, etc. in birds and fishes. Then, the bald eagle had almost gone extinct, but their population began to rebound once DDT was banned. So, this was the classic case, that is, the population of bald eagle was a classic example on how DDT acted on animals and birds. Then, DDT is an agent known to be carcinogenic. So, DDT can also cause cancer. Then, it is also an endocrine disruptor. That is, it can cause reproductive and developmental problems in humans and other species. Yes, when it affects growth hormone, pituitary hormone, thymus hormone, parath hormone. So, when all these occurs, various coordination and other body activities will be disrupted. Then, come to next endosulfon. So, endosulfon is a colorless solid friends. Friends, we know that in Kerala, the endosulfon victims is a perennial issue that is going on since several decades. So, these are the victims of endosulfon. So, macrocephaly that is big head and then cerebral palsy, then prosthesis or paralysis. So, these are the side effects of endosulfon. Then, coming to more facts, endosulfon is a colorless solid. Then, endosulfon can be utilized as pesticides and wood preservative. So, both as pesticides and wood preservative, it can be used. Then, it is an endocrine disruptor that is causing acute toxicity. So, what is endocrine disruptor? We studied in the last slide. Then, it has the potential to bioaccumulate and it also has the potential to cause biomagnification as well. Then, endosulfon can lead to spermatogenic and steroidogenetic cycle interference. Yes, it can interfere with the cycle of sperm generation and steroid generation. And as an organochlorin compound, endosulfon can cause organochlorin compound poisoning. So, what is organochlorin compound poisoning? Friends, organochlorin is a carbon compound with chlorine and we know about chlorine poisoning. So, in the chlorine poisoning, what are the symptoms? That is, neurological toxicity such as myoclonic jerking, prosthesias, tremor and ataxia. So, these are neurological disorder friends. We will discuss them in detail when we take up neurological diseases. So, as of now, make sure that organochlorine poisoning, it causes neurotoxicity and these are the symptoms of them. Then, come to more about endosulfon. It can cause blindness in cows and lack of muscle coordination in pigs. So, lack of muscle coordination is one of the basic attributes of prosthesias and then it has the possibility to act as mutagen. So, it can cause mutation in the genes of various cells and it is mutagenic to yeast cells and bacterial cells. So, now it has been found that it can cause alteration in the genes of yeasts and bacterial cells and it can also cause the same mutations to other animal or other organisms as well. Then, endosulfon exposure can result in lowered testis weights, damaged seminiferous tubules and reproductive organ deterioration. So, it can cause huge ill effects on the reproductive organs and the reproductive cycle. Then, endosulfon can be dangerous to bees, birds, fish and aquatic invertebrates. So, not only for bigger animals, even for smaller ones, endosulfon is a danger. Then, endosulfon residue has been found in well water, surface water and even food products like vegetables and milk. So, not only in the animals, it can also get accumulated in the environment like in water and also in vegetables and milk. So, this is all about DDT and endosulfon. Then, coming to next, diclofenac and neonicotinoids. First one, diclofenac. Friends, what is diclofenac? So, you are move, volume spray, all those things are made of diclofenac. It is a painkiller. Then, out of 8 species of vultures found in India, 3 of them, that is the oriental white-backed vulture, then long-billed vulture and slender-billed vulture, they are listed as being threatened with extinction after rapid population declines began in 1990s. So, why this began? It was mainly due to diclofenac bioaccumulation within them and we will see how it affected the vultures. The Bombay Natural History Society and others trace the cause of this rapid decline to diclofenac and then the death occurred within a few days and extensive kidney damage. So, this diclofenac, it will accumulate in the vultures and it will cause kidney damage on them. And this was found in the post-mortem of those birds. Then, diclofenac poisoning is slow and vultures exhibit neck dropping syndrome for about 7 to 15 days before their death. 
so once the kidney fails they will undergo depression and they undergo weaknesses and their heads will drop for 7 to 15 days before their death then after the ban of diclofenac efforts on searching for an alternative drug finally manifested and that is called meloxicam and meloxicam has been tested on over 700 birds from 60 species without any fatalities so meloxicam has emerged as a healthy alternative to diclofenac then come to next neonicotinoids so neonicotinoids are the most widely used class of insecticides so they are not pesticides insecticides and they are used in united states extensively then neonicotinoids are typically applied as seed treatments by seed producers before selling to farmers so they are also used as seed treatment agents and then its water soluble property makes it the best insecticide so it is soluble in water so it is hydrophilic not hydrophobic then its negative effects include honeybee colony collapse disorder and loss of birds due to a reduction in the insect population so friends its ill effects are the first one honeybee colony collapse disorder and second one is that as it is an insecticide it will kill almost all the insects so these birds which will prey on these insects they go with the shortage of prey and food and that is why their population also dwindles then some sources have proposed that neonicotinoids reduce a bee colony's ability to survive in the winter that is in winter honey bees can increase the body temperature on their own but with the consumption of these neonicotinoids they will not be able to do that then the neonicotinoids act on certain kinds of receptors in the bee's nervous synapse so what is nerve synapse it is that chemical which will transfer the signals from one nerve cell to other nerve cell so when this nerve synapse or the nerve chemical is damaged then their nervous system will be harmed and then they impact some bees ability to foraging for nectar so their gps will be harmed so where to find a way where did i come from where i have to go all these things will be forgotten by the honey bees and once they come out of their hives once they come out of their colonies and they can't know where is the nectar and once they find nectar if at all they can't know the way back home to their hives so that is why the colony will be dispersed and they cannot join their colonies so this is the honey bee colony collapse disorder so this is how neonicotinoids will harm the bees colonies then come to next coronavirus mutation friends we have seen various mutants of coronavirus by now but what are those so these are named on two bases that is the variants of concern and the variants of interests so these are the famous variants of concern that is the alpha beta gamma and delta so alpha is a b117 and beta is the b1351 and gamma p1 and delta b16172 and when all these have been occurred they have been occurred in the september 2020 alpha in uk then beta in south africa this is a south african variant then gamma is a brazilian variant and b16172 it is an indian variant so this was very dangerous during the second wave and then coming to variants of interest so here we have epsilon eta kappa lambda lota theta and zeta so friends these are the greek alphabets so coronavirus mutants are named after the greek alphabets so here we have some of the variants of interest like b1429 b1427 it is once again a united states variant and then we have eta that is b1525 and this was in multiple countries and then kappa that is b16171 so once again b16172 and b16171 they are indian variants then lambda c37 it is a peru south american variant then lota b1526 it is a us variant then theta p3 it is a filipino variant then zeta it is a brazilian variant so now friends what is a variant of concern and what is a variant of interest we will see so variants of concern these variants have the following properties like increase in the transmissibility or detrimental change in the covid-19 epidemiology so variants of concern these are causing some concern to the world that is why the name concern comes so they are highly virulent in nature so such mutations will increase in virulence or the change in the clinical disease presentation so there will be change in antigen and other chemicals which are helpful for the detection of the virus so this results in decrease in the effectiveness of public health measures social measures and other diagnostic techniques so our vaccines medicines remdesivir etc they will go ineffective under these variants of concern mutation but however what is variant of interest 
so it is only a phenotypical change that is only the color and only the characteristics of virus changes but they will be under the medicinal surveillance or it can be tracked and there will be no significant increase in the virulence only the phenotypical only the outer beauty will be changed then identified to cause community transmission in multiple countries so they are causing transmission but they are not so dangerous and there is no sudden change in them and then it assessed to be a variant of interest by who so if there is a famous virus that is being transmitted then who will designate it as a variant of interest so people can study over that and they can invent vaccination so this is all about the coronavirus mutation then coming to next thrombosis friends thrombosis is the formation of a blood clot inside a blood vessel friends you know that the platelets will cause the blood clotting in human body so platelets will trigger the protein called thrombinogen and thrombin and this will trigger fibrinogen and fibrin and this fibrins and fibrinogens will cause the blood clotting so now what is thrombosis when these thrombins and thrombinogens when they act in excess they will cause unnecessary blood clots so this is all about thrombosis that is when a blood vessel is injured the body uses platelets and fibrin to form a blood clot to prevent the blood loss and even when a blood vessel is not injured the blood clots occur because of excessive triggering of this thrombinogen and thrombin so this is all about thrombosis and a clot or a piece of clot that breaks free and begins to travel around the body so that unnecessary blood clot that occurs inside a vein or an artery if it breaks and if it starts moving all over the body it is called embolus so that which moves in the veins is called embolus and then thrombosis may occur in veins that is venous thrombosis or in arteries that is arterial thrombosis then venous thrombosis leads to congestion of the affected part of the body congestion here in the sense excess of blood so blood is coming in via artery but it is not going out of veins so here blood is congested and then while arterial thrombosis affects the blood supply and leads to damage of tissue supplied by that artery so when the arterial thrombosis occurs the very inlet of the blood will be stopped and that is why the cell will die due to lack of nutrients so these are the effects of thrombosis then coming to more facts regarding thrombosis a piece of either an arterial or venous thrombosis can break off as an embolus and which can travel throughout the circulation so it is called embolism and then this type of embolism is known as thromboembolism and then complication can arise when venous thrombolism lodges in the lungs and it is called pulmonary embolism so this embolus when it blocks the vein or artery that is going to lungs or the vein or artery that is going to heart it can cause a huge damage or it can even be fatal to the human beings or animals so this is all about thrombosis then come to next parosmia and mucormycosis so parosmia is a term used to describe the health condition that distort your sense of smell friends you know that parosmia is one of the pre condition of corona so if you have parosmia or if you lack smell and taste then it is an indication that you are going to get the corona virus in one or two days then in severe cases we would be sensing a persistent foul odor especially when food is around so now in case of acute parosmia not only the lack of smell you start having a foul smell and then this occurs as a result of damage to your olfactory neurons yes those nerves which track the smell if they are damaged then that results in parosmia then it can also be due to damage to the olfactory lobe or that part of the brain which detects the smell and then it is one of the first symptoms of alzheimer's disease and parkinson's disease so this olfactory lobe if this is damaged then that symptoms will be shown by the parosmia and when the brain is further damaged that leads to alzheimer's and parkinson's and other neural disorders and then dementia and huntington's disease also bring in difficulty in sensing the smells properly so in almost all the neural disorders this parosmia is a common symptom then come to next mucormycosis friends we know that mucormycosis was common during the aftermath of covid-19 infection so this is a typical case of mucormycosis now coming to the facts mucormycosis is also known as black fungus and is a serious fungal infection it can even cause death and it occurs usually in people with reduced ability to fight infections so those who are weak in immunity they will be the victims of this mucormycosis 
and it most commonly infects the nose, the sinuses that is the part above the nose, then eye and brain resulting in runny nose and one sided facial swelling. So, here we can see the one sided facial swelling and blurred vision and bulging eye and tissue death. Tissue death means gangrene. So, here this black part is the tissue death or gangrene. Then it may infect the lungs, stomach and intestines and skin. So, wherever it infects, it causes the tissue death. Then it is spread by spores of molds or the other mucorails, most often through inhalation, contaminated food or contamination of open wounds. Friends, it is a fungus and obviously it spreads through the spores of the fungi. So, this is all about mucormycosis. Then coming to next, neuroprosthesis. So, friends, what is neuroprosthesis? So, what is prosthesis in the first place? So, it is a prosthetic. We have a prosthetic eye, we have a prosthetic ear, we have prosthetic leg. So, likewise we have neuroprosthesis. So, this is neuroprosthesis wherein your brain signals will be tracked and that will be converted into speech. And when you are mentally paralyzed, our kith and kin, they can hear what we are going to say. So, this is a typical neuroprosthesis. So, now why is it in use? Because neuroprosthesis, it has recently restored words to a man with paralysis. So, this was being attached to a man with acute paralysis. Now, more about neuroprosthesis, a technology that allows people with paralysis to communicate even if they are unable to speak on their own. Yes, we know that. Then, this is the first successful demonstration of direct decoding of full words from the brain activity. Friends, even before we had neuroprosthesis, but that used to detect the spelling and type one by one. But now, this new neuroprosthetic is not decoding the spelling, it is decoding the word itself. So, now what happens? The recognition of brain signals will go faster and then translates signals into intended control muscles of vocal system for speaking words. So, in case of paralysis, what happens friends? Our brain will be passing the signals, but our vocal cords or the vocal muscles, they will be paralyzed. They will not be shaking properly. So, in that cases, that signals will be detected and your speaker will speak on behalf of you. And then, the system decodes words rather than spellings. Yes, we know that and it has auto-correct facility. So, if any signal is varying, then it can auto-correct on its own. So, now as a whole, the speed and precision of the machine will be increased and it will be more efficient in delivering the speech of the paralyzed person. So, this is all about neuroprosthesis. Then, come to next, neural disorders. Friends, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, epilepsy, all these will be often in use. And now, we will discuss the first one, Parkinson's disease. So, it is caused due to genetic disorder. And it may also be caused due to pollution or other pollutants which impact on your health. And now coming to the symptoms, it is a long term degenerative disorder and it mainly affects the motor system. So, what is motor system? That is your voluntary muscles. So, your hand movement, then leg movement, these are the motor system. So, when you are attacked with the Parkinson's disease, you can't move your legs and hands and you can't move. So, this is the state of a Parkinson's disease patient. So, he will be unable to move and walk. Friends, Parkinson's disease is mainly due to age factor. So, as and when you get aged, so Parkinson's disease will set in because of some mutations in your brains. Now, coming to next, Alzheimer's disease. Once again, this is also caused by genetic mutation and moreover, it is caused by the shrinking of hippocampus. So, friends, we know that hippocampus is that part wherein the new memory will be stored. So, if you want to have a more memory, then your hippocampus should be enlarged. And now, if the hippocampus is shrinking, then you will suffer from dementia or the memory loss. Then you will suffer from mood swings. So, your brain will swing from one mood to another and then self-neglect. So, you will neglect yourself. Then, come to the next epilepsy. Friends, this is also a genetic disorder, but it can also be caused by prenatal injuries. That is, that injury is to the head which caused during your birth or before your birth when you are in the womb of your mother. Then, even some infectious diseases can also cause epilepsy. So, now, what is epilepsy, friends? Friends, sometimes when you are sitting idly, your eyelid will switch on and switch off or it will hit. Yes, friends, and some of your elders, they treat it as bad omen. That if your left eye hits, it is a bad omen. If your right eye hits, it is a good omen. So, when your eyelid is hitting, what is the cause of it? It is that your muscle is vibrating. The same way, your nerve will vibrate. And when your nerve vibrates, and that vibration of the nerve is called epilepsy. Now, take an example. 
the nerve which coordinates to the movement of your hand it vibrates automatically your hand will vibrate as like your nerve is vibrating inside so an epileptic patient will suddenly twitch their arms or legs just like your eyelid twitches your arms and legs they start twitching or it can also cause seizures for some seconds so seizures means hanging friends how your phones or laptops will hang the same type your mind will hang and you will go blank of thoughts so these are the symptoms of epilepsy friends epilepsy is different from fits fits is mainly caused due to hormonal disorders or hormonal variations and that is triggered by the stress but epilepsy is not triggered by the stress it is triggered on its own so to hit a eyelid you need not have a stress but for fits you should have that stress so that you will get tremors and your saliva will start oozing out of the mouth so this is all about epilepsy then coming to next huntington's disease friends it is caused by stress and emotional problems so just like fits huntington's disease is caused by stress and emotions and now the main symptom of huntington's disease is loss of multitasking for example friends march first so in the march first when your left leg moves front your left hand should go back or the vice versa should happen but that will not happen in huntington's disease patients so they cannot do the multitasking they cannot close their eyes and fold their hands at a time and in acute cases they can also experience tremors or the twitchings and shakes and this loss of coordination and loss of multitasking is called the chorea or it is also called huntington's chorea then come to next galian barre syndrome so it is caused by immune system damaging the peripheral nervous system so our immune system it will be over activated and that will go and damage our peripheral nervous system that is spinal cord and nerves so now when the damage is in the spinal cord the first thing happens is the back pain and then automatically our muscles will be weakening and then our blood pressure and our breathing will be weakening because our nerves that is controlling our lungs and also controlling our heart will weaken so back pain is the main symptom of galian barre syndrome and hyperimmunity is the main cause behind it then coming to cerebral palsy friends this is a genetic disorder and it can also be caused due to preterm birth so this is a typical cerebral palsy patient so we have seen kids like this who have weak muscle coordination weak brain coordination lack of speech and hyper excitability and all those things now coming to the symptoms a group of permanent movement disorders that appear in early childhood so these children they cannot walk and they cannot stand on their knees because their knee joints will be very weak and then stiff muscles then speech and hearing impairments so all these are common symptoms of cerebral palsy so these are some of the neural disorders then coming to next omega 3 fats and trans fats friends why was it in news because an omega 3 fatty acid was found to be poisonous for tumors or it is found that these omega 3 fatty acids they can control cancers or they can curb cancers or it can be used as treatment to cancers now most common omega 3 fatty acid that is dha or the docosahexaenoic acid is crucial for brain function for vision then regulating inflammation and other phenomena so the same can be used to treat cancer so how it will treat cancer friends friends dha will undergo pre oxidation in the acidic environment so when you provide acid to these fatty acids they will burn away so they will get oxidized now friends we know that in the tumors the acidity will increase so the negative ph or the acidic environment is one of the sine qua non for the cancerous tumors so all the cells will be in the acidic environment so now what happens if the cells which is undergoing the mutation and it is becoming cancerous if it has even one cell of this dha or the omega 3 fatty acid this omega 3 fatty acid will pre oxidize and if this pre oxidizes then it will release highly toxic chemicals that leads to death of this cell so now if omega 3 fatty acids if they oxidize then it can easily kill the cancerous cell or it can control the tumors or it can control the cancer now in this context we will revise those fats trans fats saturated fats unsaturated fats etc friends omega 3 fatty acid what is this it is a polyunsaturated fatty acid so now we will begin with a saturated and unsaturated fatty acid so here we have a chain of compound so this is a saturated fat and this is called unsaturated fat so what is the difference friends here in this part 
we have the difference. That is, here instead of single bond of carbon, we have double bonds of carbon. So, why single bond and double bond friends? Here, two hydrogens connected are being absent. So, due to lack of this hydrogen which are giving electrons to these carbon atoms, so these carbon compounds they will share one electron. So, that is why double bond comes here. We know that carbon has the capability to form double and triple bonds. But however, these double bonds they are not stable, they are hyper reactive. So, that is why these unsaturated fatty acids, if we bring them to the acidic environment, they will readily get oxidized. So, they will undergo chemical change. So, that is why we can say that these unsaturated fatty acids, they are helpful for health. But these saturated fatty acids, they are very stable in nature and it is very difficult to metabolize them. So, that is why they are dangerous. So, we cannot burn this saturated fat easily. Then coming to what is polyunsaturated fatty acid. So, here the unsaturation is in 2 to 3 positions. So, here we have 2 double bonds. So, these are poly. So, multiple double bonds and triple bonds if they are present, it is a polyunsaturated fatty acid. So, now what is a cis and trans fatty acid? Friends, here we can see a cis fatty acid and here we can see the trans fatty acid. So, what is the difference? So, difference is here. So, here for the double bond of these two carbon atoms, the hydrogens are being attached on the same side. But here, the hydrogens are attached on the two different sides. So, now, when the hydrogens are attached on the two different sides, such compounds will gain stability. Friends, we know that stable fats are almost dangerous because it is hard to metabolize them. It is hard to burn them. So, once again, even in the unsaturated fatty acids, if they transform into a trans fatty acid, then once again, they will become dangerous. So, these sunflower oils, then soya oils, which are unsaturated fats, if they are converted into trans fats, that is in the course of your making pizza, burger, lace, curcuma, etc., you will heat those fats and in the course of heating, they will get converted into trans fats. So, that is why the trans fats will be more dangerous. So, this is all about fats and trans fats. Then, come to next monoclonal antibodies. Friends, why the need of monoclonal antibodies occurs in the first place? That is due to increasing cases of cancer. Friends, we will discuss in detail. That is, we know that cancer cells will multiply in number and they will multiply speedily. But our immune system, it will not provide the antibodies in that very speed. And it will not provide similar type of antibodies. So, once the immunity system triggers, then it will provide antibodies for almost all the types of bacteria, virus, fungi, etc. But now, we want only those type of antibodies which can attack this cancerous cell. So, now producing that only single type of antibody is called monoclonal antibody synthesis or we are synthesizing only that type of antibody which can attack these cancer cells and which can kill them. And now, what type of antibodies are mostly used? So, this is the CTL or the T cell lymphocyte. Friends, we know that there are two types of lymphocytes that is the B cell and T cell lymphocytes. So, B cell will produce antibodies and T cell will fight on its own that is directly and it will be having a protein called PD-1 protein or the protein death protein. So, if protein death protein is enhanced or triggered in this T cell lymphocyte, then it will automatically come and destroy the cancerous cell. But what happens is that this cancerous cell, it will be having a P death ligand protein. So, this P death ligand protein, this can weaken the P death protein. So, now when this P death protein is switched off, then this T cell lymphocyte that will not act on this cancer and this cancer can survive. So, this is the mechanism how cancer cells will switch off the T cell lymphocyte by switching off the P death protein. Now, we should have two types of antibodies. What are those antibodies? We should have that type of antibody which can weaken this PDL1 protein and which can strengthen this PD-1 protein. So, now, if you produce only those type of antibodies which can strengthen this PD-1 protein, what they will do? They will come and act as a plug here. So, they will stay here and they will block this PD-L1 from blocking this switch. And now, this T cell lymphocyte, it can act on this cancer cell. So, now, we want n number of those antibodies which can enhance PD-1 or we want n number of those antibodies which can weaken PD-L1. So, this n number of similar type of antibodies are nothing but monoclonal antibodies. So, now how to prepare these monoclonal antibodies? It is we make use of the same tumor cell to reproduce them. 
how so we will take up an immune cell of an organism how we will take up an immune cell we have to insert antigen into the organism so automatically the immune cell will be triggered and it starts its immunization action so when we search the blood sample of that organism then we will get the immune cells so we have extracted immune cell and throughout the immune cell there will be antibodies attached but they will be several types of antibodies there will not be similar type but now we will extract only one kind of antibody here and we will attach this to the tumor cell so we will extract one tumor cell or the cancer causing cell and we will attach this to it and friends this attachment of this antibody or the similar kind of antibody to tumor cell is called hybridomas so this hybridoma cell we know that it is a cancerous cell and it will multiply speedily in number and once it multiplies then we will remove this antibodies and we will store it as monoclonal antibodies and once we give it to the body these antibodies will go and plug the pd1 protein and it will enhance pd1 or it will weaken the pdl1 or the protein death ligand so in that case they will act as a anti cancer agents or they can treat cancer so this is all about monoclonal antibodies i hope you have understood then come to last part friends many of you might be doctors might be scientists might be health specialists friends it is good that you have taken up civil service to serve the nation but you will also serve the nation in a much better way if you pursue further in that study and if you come up with some beautiful solutions to the complex health problems of the day friends an ias officer can also go on and he can find a treatment for endosulfan victims an ias officer can also perform researches and he can find a vaccination to covid-19 so do not leave your passion as a health specialist just because you are opting for civil service exam take it as a hobby and pursue it and try to find solutions for those problems wherein the world is praying for wherein the world is begging for and if you do that the whole world will be indebted to you do it all the very best good luck friends